1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 and 5. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge. Beloved, all of Paul's letters to the churches, except that to the Galatians, and there's good reason for that exception, all of Paul's epistles open in the same sort of way. First there is the greeting, and we looked at the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 1 last week, mentioning the author, Paul, and sometimes those who are with him. Then we have those who are addressed. Here it is the Church of God, which is at Corinth, followed by the benediction. Grace be unto you and peace. Paul the author to this particular church, described in various ways, followed by the benediction. Well, after the opening reading, Paul writes either a thanksgiving, a thanksgiving to God, or a blessing of God. And in this passage, it's a thanksgiving. Verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf. And this thanksgiving runs from verse 4 all the way to verse 9. And this morning we're going to look at the first part of the thanksgiving in verses 4 and 5. Now last week when we considered the greeting in the first three verses, we saw what the church is. With each individual congregation being a part of the one great universal church. So that Jesus Christ is our Lord. And he is the Lord of all true churches. Wherever they may be. So that Christ is Lord both ours and theirs. Then we noted that this universal church is also a holy church that we are called out of the ungodly world and called into union with the crucified and risen Lord Jesus so that grace and mercy and peace come to us from the triune God through Christ with the minister as Christ's representative blessing the congregation. And this universal church, this holy church, is emphatically God's church. The church of God, writes Paul, which is at Corinth, or Antioch, or Balawina, or Dune, or Linden, or Sao Paulo, or wherever. The church is God's church, with he being the one who builds the church, who preserves his church, who determines each and every member of the church, who fixes the roles of each member in the body, because the church is God's own peculiar possession and treasure. Now, if verses 1 through 3 tell us what the church is, verses 4 and 5 teach us that God gives to his church. The church belongs to God, therefore he gives gifts to her. And more specifically, in this text, God enriches the church with all utterance and all knowledge. Consider then, enriched in all utterance and knowledge, very simply, the meaning Verse 5, and the thanksgiving, <clears throat> verse 4. After his opening greeting then, the apostle tells us, as he told the Corinthians in the first instance 2,000 years ago, that Corinth was a church enriched in all 
utterance. And if you draw upon your knowledge of this church at Corinth, you will readily appreciate that Corinth was a church blessed <coughs> with several fine visiting preachers. In the first instance, we think of the Apostle Paul himself, Saul of Tarsus, who met Christ and was commissioned by him on the Damascus Road. Paul founded this congregation. The great apostle to the Gentiles, the one who was not a single whit behind the chiefest of the apostles, who labored more abundantly than they all, spent 18 months, a year and a half, in Corinth, according to Acts 18, verse 11, making Paul's stay in Corinth one of the longest stays of the apostle anywhere in all his journeys. He spent an awful lot of time in that city at the special request of Jesus Christ who appeared to him and said, Stay in Corinth, Paul, because I have much people in that city. There are a lot of the elect who must be gathered. Spend more than you ordinarily would in time there for their sakes. So Paul preached Lord's Day by Lord's Day in that city for a year and a half. And he was busy in between Sundays too. Secondly, Apollos also taught there. Apollos was from Alexandria, the city named after Alexandria, Alexander the Great, and the most famous and largest city in Egypt. Apollos, as befits his city of origin, was a very capable man and an eloquent speaker, and he was mighty in the scriptures, we're told. So this congregation was enriched in all utterance and knowledge because Paul, the greatest of the apostles, and Apollos, spent time and preached there. We might also add Silas, who was a prophet, a prophet from Jerusalem, and Timothy <coughs> in Lystra, modern-day Turkey, also labored with Paul in Corinth. They were the two that went with Paul on his second missionary journey as the New Testament history class for juniors is currently studying. So there's no doubt then that Almighty God used these four visiting preachers to develop the gift of gospel proclamation in his church and in his church leaders at Corinth. At the end of Paul's first missionary journey we have the highly significant note in Acts 14 verse 23 that it was Paul's purpose <coughs> to ordain elders in all the churches and so constitute them as congregations of Christ with their own local oversight. Add to that the statement of 1 Timothy 3 that elders must be apt to teach. So if you have ruling elders able to teach in respect of their ruling in the congregation, teaching about behavior, church discipline, and unity, and love, and the good of the body. And then also you have teaching elders able to instruct and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, as was Paul's custom, he would have seen to it that there were qualified men ordained at Corinth as elders and pastors who were apt to teach consistent with their office. And the book of 1 Corinthians itself testifies to the existence of teachers, local teachers, in this congregation. I'm thinking first of all of 1 Corinthians 12, verse 29. 
which refers to apostles, the twelve plus Paul, secondarily prophets, and Silas for sure was a prophet, although he was an outsider who came for a time. Thirdly, teachers. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 29 even states, let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. So there may well have been not only teachers, but prophets in that congregation, as there were prophets in the church at Antioch and at Jerusalem. And Paul seems to allude to the four visiting teachers and the presence of prophets and teachers in their own midst in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15 when he says, Though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, hyperbole, they didn't literally have 10,000, but they had a lot. Though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, Yet have ye not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Though they had many teachers, Paul, in a certain sense, had the primacy there under Jesus Christ because they were born again and brought to faith, many of them, through his labors on his second missionary journey. And so Corinth then, like Jerusalem, like Antioch, was equipped with a number of prophets and teachers. Acts 13 begins with explaining that Barnabas was at Antioch and Simeon and Lucian and Manian and Saul or Paul. Five. The church of Corinth too was likewise, likewise gifted with capable teachers. Now this fifth verse Paul says, ye are enriched by him in all utterance. And so the apostle here, speaking to the church, you, or ye, isn't only referring to the church leaders, but he says to the church as a whole, you are enriched by God in all utterance. So this widens it out, not only do we have the utterances of the church leaders and office bearers, but also the utterance of the members. So there's public teaching and private teaching from office bearers and also the edification of the saints by each other in the congregation. There's prophecy in this church and teaching and witnessing. We know from 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 that there was the communication of the gospel in various different languages with others interpreting the languages. This is what the Bible means by the gift of tongues, a great blessing to be able to speak in different languages and communicate the word of God to those of different tongues. So we have then all forms and ways of speaking of God's truth in Jesus Christ crucified, <clears throat> practical issues, more doctrinal issues, devotional, apologetic, words of encouragement and edification. So that the congregation and the saints as a whole knew how to admonish and instruct and encourage and exhort one another. Because Christ was working in their midst. <laughs> by his Holy Spirit. And so Paul says, this is his inspired evaluation of this congregation, you are enriched as a church in all sorts and kinds of others. The Apostle says more than that though, he says that you are enriched in all knowledge. Not just some or most, but all knowledge. And the Apostle uses an intriguing and significant order 
He does not say, you are enriched in all knowledge and in all utterance. If he had said that, it would have implied that the church was enriched by God with all knowledge, and out of this knowledge, then the church spoke and witnessed. That would make good sense, but it isn't the order of our text. The apostle says, you are enriched in all utterance and in all knowledge. And here the idea is that God gave the ability to communicate the truth of his gospel to the church, which of course implies they had a certain amount of knowledge in the first place, but more especially now the idea is that the church then in turn grew in knowledge beyond that through the various gifts and forms of utterance. So these Corinthians then were enriched in utterance and knowledge. <coughs> through the ministries of Paul and Apollos and Silas and Timothy, through her own teachers, through the mutual edification of her members, with the result that the church was enriched in all knowledge. All knowledge. This church knows the central truth through which alone God is known, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. <coughs> they know that forgiveness is to be found only through his atoning death and resurrection from the dead. They knew, Paul goes on to refer to this a few verses later, they knew that this same Jesus would come again, not now in humiliation, but in glory, in the clouds of heaven, to be publicly acknowledged as Lord and Judge of the quick and the dead. They knew, therefore, as Paul puts it in chapter 8, verse 4, that idols and all other gods are nothing. Not everybody knows that. <clears throat> and so they understood, Paul teaches about this too, that there is no sin in itself to eat food from the market, which had previously been sacrificed to idols. <coughs> chapter 8. You are enriched in all knowledge. I just touched on a few things that this epistle especially suggests. But they knew not only some doctrines or a few favorite themes, but all knowledge. Because they were instructed in the whole counsel of God. Now at this stage, you might be wondering, given your knowledge of 1 Corinthians, you might be wondering, what does Paul mean then in the opening verses of chapter 3, when he calls them carnal and even babes in Christ? I read 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk like a baby, and not with meat or solid food. For hitherto, like a child of a few weeks or months old, you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. What a sharp word. For ye are yet still carnal. <coughs> For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? The distinction here, and the true way of reconciling this statement, you're rich in all knowledge and wisdom, chapter 1, and you're carnal and like babes in Christ, chapter 3, the key distinction here is ethical. You have 
the abstract knowledge, if we may so put it, chapter 1, but ethically, the knowledge isn't filtering down, sinking in, and doing the good that it should be doing because you're childish and immature spiritually and carnal because you're envying and fighting among one another and divided and you're living in that sense just like the ungodly heathen. So the Corinthians of knowledge, all kinds of knowledge, enriched in Christian knowledge, they understood the doctrine of the gospel, they grasped and embraced intelligently the truth of the scriptures, they had a great wealth of it, they abounded in this knowledge. In verse 7 of chapter 1, they were not a whit behind any other church in this knowledge. God has certainly not given to them less than other congregations, and whereas the Hebrews needed to be taught again the first principles of the oracles of God, the Corinthians certainly didn't. But, and this we learn from other parts of 1 Corinthians, especially chapter 3, the Corinthians had this knowledge without a due measure of love and humility. Abstractly, they knew their doctrines. They could have done fairly well in a catechism class or an end of year exam. But the problem was they had a sinful attitude towards the knowledge that God had given them. And so it's precisely in 1 Corinthians that we have that statement. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Namely, knowledge, if it is alone, and that's the only matter, puff somebody up so that they swell like one of those Amazonian toads, but charity, that is love, edifies and builds up. They had a knowledge which led them, because they received it sinfully, led them to a sort of arrogance and boasting and sinful competition in the church. I know more than you. That sort of So you can picture this church in Corinth then, enriched in all utterance, <laughs> people can talk the talk, and in all knowledge, so they have it up here, possessed of oratorical and intellectual gifts, with members engaged in extensive, elevated discussions on the basis of their insight into spiritual things. We might say they had a few, or maybe even many, amateur theologians in their midst, members of book clubs in today's age, who could read and retain a fair bit of it. But this led to a certain amount of pride and debates and discussions and factions and divisions. which occasioned, in part, the first Corinthians. Our church shares several characteristics with the Church of God at Corinth. And I deliberately said several. I did not say all. Thankfully, not all. This congregation, and it stretches back before most of us, me included, this congregation has been gifted with capable teachers in the past. Reverend George Hutton of the Bible Presbyterian Church, by all accounts, most of us were there, was a capable preacher. Those long enough in the tooth, so to speak, who were here for some years will remember that we have had in our midst many ministers from the Protestant Reformed churches who led us deeper into the Reformed faith 
1993, I believe it was, God sent Reverend Henkel, a very fine minister and theologian, to be our missionary pastor. Over the years, we've been blessed with the preaching of various professors, even, at conferences and the pulpit. Reverend McGill has preached here on numerous occasions too, and Lord willing, we're looking forward to the visit of Reverend High. This congregation too, in large part through these men, has had knowledgeable members. Our people, by God's grace, it's nothing to boast about, typically have read a significant number of books, good books, solid books. Most of you subscribe and read the Standard Bear. Good work, keep it up, some fine material there. We go through the Heidelberg Catechism, so you're enriched in all knowledge. The key doctrines of the Christian faith are gone through systematically. We have the Canons of Dort, a great treasure in the church, on the truth of God's sovereign grace. For the last two or three years, we've been going through the Belgic Confession. Many of you here would not be here unless you had taken pains to study and learn the truth, prayed for more light, engaged in discussions, had to sacrifice beliefs that you thought were right and painfully had to give up. We've all had that. Our children too have been catechized and trained in their homes and are knowledgeable of the Reformed faith according to their age and capacity. We don't know everything. Good job we didn't know everything. I said I personally or else there wouldn't be much need for me to preach. And it is undoubtedly true that our obedience lags behind our knowledge as it does with everybody because nobody lives up to what they know apart from the Lord Jesus. So that I think we can say we have knowledge in various areas. We're even enriched in knowledge, but that's no reason for indifference or sluggishness because the more you know, the more strictly you will be judged by Jesus Christ, and there's an awful lot more to learn. You can even say too that our own congregation has had members possessed with skill in utterance, and still does. There are those who can witness to others, as everybody can and must and should, according to their capacity and opportunity. Those who can witness to others of the grace of God and Jesus Christ, and many of us are here this morning because of other members who had that ability and grace, who witness to us, so that we're not here, People especially versed in particular subjects who can clearly and logically and sympathetically present the truth of the Word of God so that we've been able even to teach the varying degrees of other people. Thus far, I think we can say there's a pretty strong <coughs> correlation between ourselves and this church in Corinth because we're not only interested in saying what that church was like in Greece 2,000 years ago. We need to know about ourselves as a congregation of Jesus Christ. We hope and trust and believe that the other part of the comparison does not hold that the knowledge and utterance that we have is not abused in arrogance so that we become proud and that we engage in divisions and factions with little groups forming here and there, as happened with Corinth. <clears throat> there were four groups in the church. It's not awful. Two's bad enough, but four groups. The Paul group, the Apollos group, the Cephas group, and the Christ group. And, verse 12 even says, every one of you 
It's not even that a few people in the congregation were above the factionalism, but every one of them was engaged in this. And self-consciously, and by speech, said, I'm with Paul. Everybody in the church knew what faction they were in. So there wasn't much love or humility there. And in a congregation like that, people are going to dabble in strange and diverse doctrines. So knowledge and love must knowledge and utterance must be governed by love and humility. So that all that sort of foolishness and carnality is put far away. And after explaining this, beloved, the Apostle Paul here goes on to express profound thanksgiving to God for these gifts of utterance and knowledge which he bestowed upon these <coughs> Corinthians. And again, you say, how can the Apostle Paul thank God for these gifts? When he knew fine well, I'll give him a few more verses and he'll start admonishing them. When he knew fine well that there was carnality and division in their midst, was Paul here engaged in some sort of irony? Was he speaking tongue in cheek when he said, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Was he saying this, in other words, thinking, and now there's also their sins. That wasn't the idea, it's not irony. Paul here is dealing with facts. This church was blessed with utterance and knowledge, and the apostle was thankful to God for the gifts that Christ gave them. Another way someone could suggest would be that maybe Paul was thanking God for the gifts which these Corinthians once had but had now lost. <coughs> but that isn't the idea either because the Corinthians had indeed received these gifts in the past but they still retain them. Paul says in verse 5 that in everything ye are enriched by him in all others and all knowledge. Not ye once were enriched but now you lost it. And 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14 indicate very clearly that the Corinthians still had these gifts. So it's not irony and it's not a thanksgiving for what they once had, but lost. Paul isn't either flattering them. He's not flattering them. Everything he says in the text is true. And later on, he's going to admonish and rebuke them for their sins. The text simply says it as it is. Here's the idea. When they do well, by God's grace, and in the area in which they are excelling, according to God's grace, he commends them. Or rather, he commends God's grace in them. And when they sin, then he brings brotherly, loving admission and rebuke. But there is a striking difference here between this thanksgiving and all the other thanksgivings that Paul offers near the beginnings of his inspired and canonical epistles. In all the other places where Paul issues a thanksgiving, he thanks God for their good works. In Romans, Paul thanks God for the evangelistic zeal of the saints there, that their, spoke was spoke, that their faith was spoken of throughout the world. Romans 1 verse 8. In Philippians, he thanks God for their good work of fellowship in the gospel. In Colossians, he thanks the Lord for their faith and love. In 1 Thessalonians, he thanks the Lord for their work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope. More good works. And in the next epistle to Thess the church of Thessalonica, He's grateful to God for their growth in faith and love. But here in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4, 
Paul does not thank God for the good works that the Corinthians wrought. They were working some pretty bad, shameful, disgusting works. But instead, he thanks God for the gifts that God had given the congregation. It's a thanksgiving, it's an encouragement, but if you think about it, it's not such a big thanksgiving and great encouragement as thanking God for the good works that he did the other congregations. There's an implied rebuke even, even in this. Because if someone comes to you and says, you have wonderful gifts, that might be a commendation, but if someone says to you, or about you, that you are doing good works and honouring Jesus Christ, that's a better thing. Somebody can have great gifts and not be using them in the Lord's service and obtain no reward. But if you're doing good works, you will be rewarded. Good works are more important than great gifts. And the Corinthians, though, didn't get that and weren't living that way which is part of the problem. So here we have in the Apostle Paul's words another indication that he is worthy of our emulation. He's truthful. He doesn't say, I thank you, I thank the Lord for all the wonderful works that you're doing, because that would border on or maybe encroach into lies, because they're engaging in pride and disobedience. Instead, he thinks truly as well. He thinks there is something for Thanksgiving here. It's not as bad as the Galatians, where he launches into a terrain and tells them that he marvels that they've so soon apostatized from God's grace through denying justification by faith alone. He finds ground for Thanksgiving. He thanks God for the way in which they excelled. In this regard, they did excel. The gifts that God had given them. He is truthful. And he is fair. He thanks the Lord for the gifts that God has given to the Corinthians. And, a few verses later, he rebukes the Corinthians for their sins. Even hand. There's some good and there's some <coughs> evil. And he mentions both. So that they could see that this was just and fair and right. And there's some wisdom in this. <coughs> Commends the grace of God in them at the start, so that later, when he brings the words of rebuke, they will be mollified to some degree at least, we hope, so uh, they will allow or permit or suffer a word of admonition. They couldn't say, well, Paul comes along, he just, just finds fault. He's always criticized. This is the way we should do with our children and we trust with our friends in the church. So hopefully they'll listen to the word of God. Now we need to see that this text says something important to us about the importance, something important to us about thanksgiving in the church. If the Apostle Paul here begins by thanking God always concerning the congregation, it surely implies that the minister must be thankful for the saints, and we trust is thankful for the congregation. And I am. You should know that. Yeah. The minister is thankful not only for your gifts, which is something, but more important, thankful for the good works of the congregation, for your fellowship in the gospel until now, Philippians, for your works of faith and labors of love and patience of hope, and they're there, for your growth in grace, and you are growing. I assume the number of people this size Presumably not everybody's growing at one time, but the body as a whole is, will be growing. We all have our moments, to put it mildly. And, along with the, the thanksgiving for graces, we ought to be thankful, and I ought to be thankful, for your God-given gifts 
gifts of spiritual discernment and constancy over many years and utterance and knowledge of the word of God and its doctrines. That's cause for thankfulness. And this thankfulness, Paul teaches, is not only to be an attitude, but it is to be expressed and expressed even in prayer. And prayer, as Paul's doing here, in the hearing of the very saints for whom Paul expresses <coughs> gratitude. So we ask for good gifts, and then we thank God that God does bring gifts and work graces in the body of the saints. And this gratitude, Paul teaches us here by his example, is to be constant. He says in verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf, or always concerning you. <coughs> for the grace of God which is given you. And if the minister must be thankful, according to Paul's example here, for the saints, well then the saints too must be grateful for the gifts that God has given us as the congregation and you individually. The measure of utterance and knowledge and steadfastness and faithfulness and zeal and understanding and in its abundance and variety because we know that these things did not come from ourselves. They didn't arise from our own hearts because we were spiritually devoid of all good and impoverished. Instead, as John the Baptist says, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from above. It came from God. It came from God because it was grace. Grace through the channel of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only mediator given you, you didn't earn. So if you are enriched passively because of the work of God, because as Paul will say to these same Corinthians, who made you to differ? Or what have you got that you didn't receive? Because flesh and blood doesn't reveal anything to us in the kingdom of heaven, but our Father So we must also be thankful for one another in the church. We ought to say to ourselves, not well, this one's got that, and this one's highly esteemed over there, and this one's got that. We ought to say instead, isn't it great that God has more wisdom than I do and gives each one according to how he sees fit? And he teaches me thereby that I'm not supposed to be jealous or bitter or think that I deserve a pedestal in the church, but rather that God gives gifts for the good of the whole body, and I'm content to play my part and serve the other saints. And so the church and kingdom of Jesus Christ is not about competition, pulling somebody else down and pushing yourself up. It's about gratitude. Gratitude. Because the ever blessed God in Jesus Christ, He owns the church. It's His church. The church of God. Chosen and redeemed and saved. And so the church exists to bring thanksgiving. Always.